and that's the sand that is on the seashore. What a wonderful story there, but it seems incredible that the Lord, or that God, would order a man to offer his son as a sacrifice. Now, the, the heathen nations around them, the ones that were steeped in idolatry, they had no trouble doing that because that was, that was not a natural thing. And as we talked this morning, getting away from natural things is what idolatry would lead you to do. So sacrificing your children, <laughs> hey, what more could a person do? You know, you're not going to sacrifice yourself. <laughs> Sacrifice a child, you know? Well, imagine the emotional stress, bless you, that, that Abraham had to be under because of what the Lord had instructed him to do here, to be like the nations, the heathen nations, the idolatrous nations around him, something that God had never asked his people to do. So this is a wonderful story of faith that is meant to prepare Israel for the coming of the Messiah and to demonstrate to us the truthfulness and beauty of God's Word. Remember we talked a little bit this morning about in philosophy uh, the concept of, uh, of beauty, right? Uh, understanding what is beautiful and what is good. And this helps us to differentiate. Hey, what is good? What are we talking about when, when we're saying that God asks us to do good things? Well, God shows us an example, doesn't He? Shows us by example. All right. So Isaac, according to the the, the Hebrew letter, was a copy and shadow of Jesus Christ. Now, in some of the translations, like the old King James Version, to say a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Now, for example, writing of the relationship between the Old Testament Aaronic priesthood and disciples of Jesus Christ today, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5 says, they, that's that Old Testament Aaronic priesthood, starting with Aaron and his sons and their descendants all the way down through, they serve a copy and shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But see, that's explained to us then in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23 through 24. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, and those rites, which were also copies and shadows, were the animal sacrifices. But listen, as the Hebrew writer goes on, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. There was a better sacrifice and better sacrifices than those animal sacrifices of the Old Testament, which put in place the Aaronic, you understand what I'm saying by Aaron, Aaronic priesthood. Verse 24, for Christ has entered into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into, are not entered into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, Remember the Old Testament tabernacle? You had the holy place, and then you had the most holy place. He has gone into something like that. They were just copies of true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So that that which uh, the sacrifices which ordained, which made or brought into being their Aaronic priesthood, there is a better sacrifice that has occurred that makes a different priesthood, that is a better priesthood, that serves as the priesthood that casts a shadow back, and that's what the Aaronic priesthood was. Just a shadow of what 
we know in the New Testament priesthood, that was animal sacrifices. But in the New Testament, you have, in the beginning, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross, but also we have the living sacrifices of each and every believer who obeys the gospel and becomes a living sacrifice, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Better sacrifice. And all of those things were the substance that become that that the light of God or the light of God's word, however you want to put it, shining on those created that shadow that is recorded in the Old Testament. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. The Apostle Peter writes, but you, well who's he writing to? Well if you go back and you start in chapter 1 verse 1 go down through there, I would suggest you'll find that these are genuine disciples of Jesus Christ. Those who have believed that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, and that they have obeyed the gospel, they have put on Christ in baptism, and they are walking according to the pattern of the New Testament. They're walking according to the instructions of their master. They are, it's Jesus talked about his true, genuine disciples. And that's who Peter is discussing here. But you are a chosen race, a royal, look at that word, priesthood. A, a priesthood that casts a shadow back here to that priesthood. A holy nation a nation set apart for God's use, a people for his own possession, a people for whose possession? Well, for God's possession, for Christ's possession. And we talked about that this morning, uh, a people in, in Titus chapter 2, uh, zealous for good works. Well, what do you mean by good works? Well, that's that aesthetics, right? What are you talking about good? Well, the New Testament tells us what the good works are. The list of this, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I, I learned uh, last Wednesday night that that word ex excellencies there and in other places is it, the same word as virtue. Virtue. And the word V-I-R in Latin, I'm told, is the word for man. And when it talks about Christ's glory and virtue, or Christ's glory and excellency, what, what Peter's talking about is Christ's manliness and his example of manliness. want to have a lesson. The Bible reveals man. But what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be virtuous, to have this excellency? And it comes back to this one thing. It's a sacrifice. The willingness to sacrifice that Jesus died upon the cross and cast that shadow clear back across the Old Testament clear back to Adam and Eve and the sacrificing of animals to make clothes to cover their sin. So the priesthood of the Old Testament ironic order was a shadow or picture of New Testament disciples currently. We're the substance of their, of them, the shadow a copy, a, a sign suggested of anything, delineation of a thing, representation, a figure, a copy. And here's a question. Are we doing any better than them? I sure hope so, because we're called to be better than them. They, they were doing something, they were doing this 
work, this holy work, this sanctified work in hope. And now, here we are, and we have the substance because Christ died upon the cross. We got the substance. They just had the shadow. A shadow. What's a shadow? That's an image cast by an object and representing the form of that object. So in what the discussion that we're having tonight, Isaac was a shadow cast by the reality of Jesus Christ who was going to come about 2,000 years later. You know what that tells us? The Bible is such a remarkable book. Yeah. So remarkable. Remember the old adage, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Don't we live a wonderful time? We really do. Mm -hmm. Isaac was a copy and shadow of Jesus Christ in many ways. But he's, remember, he's just a copy. A copy, but, but just the shadow of the substance. Both had a what is characteristic or characterized as a miraculous birth, right? Because how old was was Abraham? Ninety years old, right? Right. He's too old. Ab uh, Sarah's too old. You know, this isn't going to happen. Jesus, born of a virgin. Wow, what a story. But only, the words only begotten were used of Isaac as well as Jesus. Only begotten. Well, wait a minute. Abraham had another son. His name was Ishmael. But he wasn't the child of promise. Sarah, Sarah's your wife. Sarah's the one that's going to have a son, and he's going to be the son of promise. So he was the only begotten of Sarah and Abraham, that promised child who was to come. And Jesus was the only begotten of the Godhead. Father, Word, and Holy Spirit, but He's the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. And we can see that from John chapter 3, verse 16, but also Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, right? Is that He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. Wow. Everlasting. Because he's as much a father as the Father and the Holy Spirit are in that transaction. Wow. Both were named by God before their birth, or by the Lord before their birth, right? Think about Isaac. Isaac means laughter, right? That's why he, he's named Isaac. But Isaac laughed in Genesis chapter 17, verses 16 through 19, right? Yeah. I'm going to come back, and you're going to have a son. Sarah's going to have a son. And, and Abraham laughed. And then later, Genesis 18, 12 through 15, uh, in, in the time period of that it takes for a child to be born, Sarah's going to have a child. And she laughed. But <laughs> then the Lord says, why did she laugh? What she laughed. Oh, why is the Lord getting down on Sarah or Sarai and, and, and not Abraham? What, what, what's the deal there? What's what's the difference? Um, did, did anybody ever tell you something that was really wonderful? Like if I told you, Lance, he won the lottery. Would you laugh? But that would be like. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> wow. But if I told you something like, you know, told Denise something like, you know, you're going to have a baby in nine months, and you laughed, it was like, I would really yeah. laugh. It's like, <laughs> wait a minute. Why are you doubting? 
Abraham's laughter was a laugh of hope for what was going to happen. You follow me? Sarai's laughter was, <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> no, no, no. And that's the difference between the two. And that's an amazing thing there, isn't it? And, and people like, you know, if you don't look at the words, you don't look at it uh, through a context like that, it doesn't make sense. It, it's, it's like, well, God's, something's wrong with Sarah. He's, he's, he's mad at her, but Abraham gets away with stuff. That's not what happened. Well, you come to Jesus then. Jesus was saying before his birth, right? Uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, uh, you shall call his name Emmanuel, right? A virgin shall shall uh, bring forth the son. You shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, that happens Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. You call his name Emmanuel. But, but more so than that, it's you shall call his name Jesus in Matthew, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. Call his name Jesus or Joshua, or more prominently in the Hebrew, Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. The name before birth. Coincidence? No. He's the substance. Isaac is the shadow. Both Isaac and Jesus faced persecution by their relatives. <laughs> Not just their enemies, okay? By their relatives. Isaac was mocked by his older half-brother Ishmael, and that caused a family crisis, didn't it? Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Paul, in Galatians chapter 4, 29, tells us that Ishmael persecuted Isaac. Because Isaac was the child of promise. You know, and, and even at first, Abraham's telling the Lord, Paul, oh, that Ishmael could be accepted by you. And the Lord says, no, it's not Ishmael. It's not Ishmael. Why not Ishmael? Because Ishmael's mother was Egyptian. Not going to happen. It's going to be from the family. Well, Jesus came to his own, John chapter 1, verse, verse 11, and his own did not receive him. Now, that's not only, that's talking about the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation, which still for the most part was congregated in, in Judea and Jerusalem at that time. Then John chapter 7, verse 5, the very first part of that, says, for not even his brothers believed in him. His half-brothers and half-sisters. He had brothers and sisters. Half-brothers, half-sisters. They didn't believe in him. They thought he was crazy. They wanted to take him home. Maybe lock him in the basement or whatever. You know, do, do to him what you do to the crazy uncle. But again, see how Isaac is that shadow. Each of them was offered as a sacrifice. Now uh, look at the details of this. Both the fathers gave their only son. Right? Abraham, only son. Put that in quotes though. The only son, the promised son, the only one. Oh, God as father. And when we say God as father, Elohim, gave the only begotten Jesus of Nazareth as a sacrifice for sins. Both men carried the wood on which they would be sacrificed. The location of both sacrifices was approximately the same according to 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1. Moriah becomes Mount Zion. Each one volunteered to be sacrificed. Uh, undoubtedly, Isaac could have overpowered Abraham. <laughs> no, <laughs> forget this. Abraham honored his 
thought and accepted what was happening. That's hard. That's hard. But think of Isaac, and Isaac was Isaac was far from a perfect person. And think about some of the things that Isaac goes through later in his life. But here, just this willingness to be a sacrifice tells us a lot about him. Well, what about Jesus? Uh, the fifth point here, the third day was prominent in both cases, right? Abraham received his son back from the dead that third day. Christ arose from the dead on the third day. And a ram was substituted for Isaac, and Jesus Christ was a substitute for us. And, 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 and first of all, he was a substitute for Barabbas, who was a murderer and an insurrectionist. But collaboratively, collectively, uh, substitute for us. All right, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is faith's game changer. That, that's where the difference is. Now, uh, look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 through 19 and this this is why I say this is where we were headed to because of that 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 copy and shadow that that the Hebrew writer is talking about okay by faith Abraham when he was tested offered up Isaac and and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son of whom it was said through Isaac shall all your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Isaac was as good as dead. Now, he wasn't physically killed and physically resurrected. It was a spiritual thing, much like our resurrection, when we die to sin, when we are buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. But we understand that concept of resurrection to a new life. He was as good as dead. Isaac was as good as dead. He believed. Faith that God would raise Isaac allowed Abraham to offer his son. But when's it going to be? Is it going to be immediately? Is it going to be three days later? Is it going to be next year? Is it going to be at the end of time? What questions did Abraham ask? Nothing's recorded. What questions did Isaac ask? Father, here, here's the wood and there's the fire. Where, where's the sacrifice? Lord will provide. They were obedient to what the Lord had said. He believed even though we have no record of the resurrection up to that time that he could resurrect him from the dead. And he did receive his son back from the dead figuratively. Now, Jesus' resurrection provides us a foundation for life and a hope for a glorious future. You know, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, he could be just another good person like Buddha, right? That had a lot of good things to say about, and here's a good way to live your life. Take the middle ground. Just don't press either way. Just, just take a little ground. That's that's Buddha's way. Or like Confucius, right? Okay. He'd just be another good dead man. But Jesus is not. Jesus was raised from the dead. So what's the lesson for us in that? First Corinthians 15, 58. 
Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, like Abraham and like Isaac and Jesus, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. <laughs> labor? I got a labor? I got a work? I, I thought all I had to do was believe and say, Lord, Lord, <laughs> I got it made. I, I got my ticket punched. I'm going on. It doesn't sound like it there, does it? But what's the labor? What labor do I have to do? Well, we come back to those what? Good works. To be zealous of good works. And what Peter said here, good works. And we've got to establish it. What are we talking about good works? That's what the Lord has laid out. Laid out. That was sacrifice to do the good works. And when we sacrifice to do the good works, you know what happens? It shows that we are resurrected from the spiritual death that sin had put us in so long ago. Or maybe not so long ago. Abraham offering Isaac as a, it was a picture of what God would do in sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of every human being. And of his sacrifice, Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So that, that's the starting point. If you don't get to there, it doesn't matter about going on further, right? That's the starting point. We've we got to get to that point. Because whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now by believing and being baptized for remission of sins, we're born again into the family of God and the kingdom of God. And that puts us in a whole different parameter of grace, the grace of God. And that's when we start walking in the light. But that's a sermon for a different time, isn't it? it isn't that a beautiful story? What, what sense does that make? Abraham, go sacrifice your son. What, you want me to be like the heathen nations around it? No. But I want to see if you really trust in me. Do we really trust in Jesus? Do we really? Kill yourself. Well, not literally, but figuratively. In the waters of baptism. Kill off that old man of sin, walk in peace. That's the lesson. It's there. It's in the Bible. Thank you for your time and your attention. If you have a need, let your need be known. Request be made. Not be made known as we stand and sing.